So welcome everyone. Today I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Suzanne Adloff. So Suzanne, I might get you to start by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about the paper that we're talking about today. Yeah, so I'm uh, Suzanne Adloff and I am an Associate Professor of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of South Carolina. And um, this paper is a study that's focused on word learning in children who have DLD or who have dyslexia. And it might help if I tell you like what I mean by those terms. So when I'm talking about children with DLD, I'm talking about those who have difficulty communicating their ideas and their thoughts, um, or they have difficulty understanding other people's um, ideas and thoughts that are communicated through spoken language. And what I mean by dyslexia is children who have a specific difficulty with word reading and spelling. So they're not very accurate and they're not very fluent. And one thing that's really important to know is that these two disorders frequently co-occur. And so uh, there was a lot of past research that suggested that word learning is difficult for both of those groups. They both have uh, vocabulary uh, difficulties. Um, for kids with dyslexia, vocabulary um, is less of an issue, um, but word learning, uh, learning new words is, uh, is known to be an issue. Uh, at the time that we began our study, um, there was a lot of research that said that both of these uh, groups would have difficulty with word learning, but that research had not separated the two disorders. So it didn't control for their co-occurrence. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, got a grant from the National Institutes of Health to study word learning in DLD and dyslexia when they occur separately and when they co-occur. And as far as I know, this is the first published study to, to do that, to look at all four groups. And our hypotheses at the time um, were pretty simple and straightforward. We thought that children with dyslexia because they have difficulties in the phonological domain of language, we thought they would have difficulty learning word names uh, with phonological aspects of word learning. So we thought they would have difficulty learning to say the name of a new item. We thought kids with developmental language disorder would have broader word learning difficulties. So we thought that they would have trouble, especially learning the meaning of new words, um, but that, that difficulty would show up on multiple tasks. Uh, so our study focused on children who were in second grade. And so in the United States, they were about eight years old. And um, we uh, classified them based on uh, a comprehensive measure of language and then um, really careful measurement of word reading. And then consistent with their classification, um, we had children with dyslexia had vocabulary that was well within normal limits and not different from typically developing children and kids with DLD who didn't have dyslexia um, had word reading that was well within normal limits and not different from typically developing children. And we used a computerized task to teach kids um, new objects and their names. And so there were eight, eight objects and the task um, was to help an astronaut named Candace learn the vocabulary of a new planet so she could go on a trip there. And so in the task, they were shown pictures of the novel objects and they would hear their names and they would hear features that were associated with the, with the objects. So for example, one of the items was a tepic and they would hear, this is a tepic, it's a kind of fruit. It has hairy red skin and it tastes sweet. And it would go on like that. After they heard the full definition, they would be asked to say the name of the item. So what's this called? You say it. So they would say it and then they would be asked to find it, You know, find the tepic and they'd see the whole array. And that training was repeated three times and we changed the order of the training so that the next time they would encounter the object, they'd, be, they'd get a question first. We found that kids, would, in our piloting, we found that kids would pay more attention to the task if they started with a question the next time they heard the information. And so over that training, they had heard the name of the object 24 times and they had practiced saying the, uh, uh, the name and they practiced finding it each of those things three times. Um, so it was pretty explicit training and there was repeated um, practice. And so our prediction was that, you know, the kids with dyslexia would have trouble learning the word names and that kids with DLD would have trouble learning the meanings. And we had five different ways to measure what they had learned about the word. So we'd give them the picture and ask them to say its name. We give them a picture and we play four names for them and we'd ask them to say back the one that was right. 
we gave them, we'd say the name, we'd say, tell us everything you know about this. And we would give them, we'd say the name, we'd say, draw it, please draw Tepic. And then we would also say, you know, Tepic, and we'd give them an array of items and have them pick one. So we have really careful assessment of word learning. And what was really surprising was that the kids who had DLD, but did not have co-occurring dyslexia performed um, very similarly to the children with typical development on four out of the five tasks. So the only task where they significantly differed from typically developing kids was on the task where we asked them to tell us everything they knew about the item. So we called that the describing task. So they recalled fewer features of the words that they had been taught. Um, in contrast, the kids who had dyslexia only, so they had good vocabulary, good oral language skills, but poor word reading skills, those children differed from typically developing children on all five measures of word learning. And so then we, so those are the, the only groups. And we also had this co-occurring DLD and dyslexia group. And so the kids who had DLD only uh, performed significantly better than that group that had co-occurring DLD and dyslexia on three out of five tasks. And the kids with dyslexia only didn't ever differ from the both group. So that was really surprising and really kind of, you know, uh, perplexing for a while. Like I, I kept wondering, did we, did we mislabel these? Is this wrong? And so it is not mislabeled, it's not wrong. We've checked it many, many times. And so it was really contrary to our expectations um, and it was contrary to their performance on these norm reference vocabulary measures that the DLD group was doing so well, com comparatively well. They still struggled versus the typical group in, some, in one way, um, but the kids with dyslexia were not struggling. And so um, the results surprised us and they really raised a lot of questions for us that we're going to continue to explore. We have a new grant. Um, well, it was new at the time and mm. we're a couple years into it now <laughs> uh, from NIH to kind of tease apart um, these results and kind of look for replication and look for, um, you know, what might explain this interesting pattern. Um, so, um, so we have some ideas. Um, one thing that I want to kind of um, make sure everyone is aware is that, you know, we only measured learning at one point in time right there, right after we taught it. So we have no knowledge of what these kids retained, right? Um, word learning in the lab is very different than word learning in the real world. So kids with the, in the dyslexia only group, at least as measured by our, voca our norm reference vocabulary test, in the real world, they were doing okay learning vocabulary. And so it was only in this contrived trap task that they weren't doing so well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that's interesting. And then, but in this contrived task, the kids with DLD did pretty well. So that might give us some pointers um, for future instruction. So we have, um, like I said, we have a lot of questions that we're following up in future studies, but that's what we have so far. That's awesome. So you, um, that great to hear what your um, study involved in some of those um, findings are really fascinating. I, I, you know, mulling them over as you're talking about them thinking, you know, what will that mean for, I guess, the work that I do? So, Suzanne, what would be some of your key messages then for clinicians like myself um, or maybe even families? Okay. Well, um, yeah. So this study was really conducted um, really for a theoretical and descriptive purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, we have a lot more questions than we have answers, but I do think that there are some um results that are interesting um, for clinicians and families to consider. So uh, one, I think, is just the importance of considering um, whether these disorders occur in isolation or, or when they co-occur, because the children um, who had co-occurring co disorders are the ones who struggle the most. For the kids who had um, DLD only, I think these results are really interesting because they might point to um, interventions that could potentially help, right? So there was parts of this training, you know, we gave a lot of exposures. It was very explicit. There was space retrieval practice. It was decontextualized. So the, you know, there wasn't a lot of other stuff to attend to. You just 
you just learn what I'm telling you to learn. It's very rote. So there was a lot of things there that might help with vocabulary learning if we found that the kids actually retain the words that we taught them. So that's, that's an if, um, um, but so there could be some, some interesting things there to explore as far as vocabulary instruction goes. Um, on the other hand, um, kids with dyslexia, whether it was by itself or whether it was with DLD and dyslexia, they didn't respond so well to this kind of instruction. So that tells us, you know, again, with all the caveats that this was an experimental study, you know, not an intervention, uh, not for intervention purposes, but if we, if we put that aside, we know that um, these kids may learn differently in response to the same instruction or, you know, they get the same instruction, but they show a different response. So our, our clinical intervention needs to be tailored to their, um, their learning needs. Um, I think that's, I think that's it. <laughs> no, that's great. That really helps. <clears throat> and I think that despite sometimes having similar presentations, we need to consider how do we individualize uh, our support for, for young people. Uh, in my case, um, some people might be working with you know, not so young people, maybe the adolescents and adults. But I think mm -hmm. that it really helps us with for, starting to formulate um, ideas for the way in which we work with maybe as clinicians, or maybe we might be family who are um, supporting our, our young person with DLD and or dyslexia. So that's wonderful. Thanks, Suzanne. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add about the study just before we wrap up? Um, well, I think I've covered most of it. I, I think I covered most of it. Um, I guess I would say, you know, I think we talked about um, the difference between like a lab-based word learning task and what word learning is like in the real world. And uh, there's really, um, that's that dichotomy. There's more than the dichotomy there, right? So the um, even when we talk about lab-based word learning, there's lots of different experimental word learning tasks and there's a lot of variation there so I think just there's I think there's a lot of work to do to understand this and Absolutely. that would be all I have to say <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for your time and as I was saying to you before we started recording thank you so much for all of your work in this space I know that um, your research around dyslexia and DLD has really helped myself and, and many others so thank you so much for um, the work that you do thank you so much it was really nice to talk to you and yeah